So raise your hand if you've ever been in love. Any time in your life you've ever been in love. Okay. Now, when you're in love, you're a little crazy, right? <laughs> like, I, things that weren't important before are, impo are important, and things that, you know, are important aren't important aren't important. You know, you're just like so taken in by the beloved. And all you want to do is spend time with the beloved, right? Now, when I was growing up, I'm a passionate, I'm all Italian. I'm for, and I'm originally from Brooklyn. I grew up in Staten Island, right? I know a lot of Brooklyn people here. A lot of, so I'm a passionate Italian girl, all right? But, but I got to tell you, even when I dated when I was young, I was very logical. I don't know what happened. I don't know. Maybe there's a little German in me. I have no idea. But I could tell you I was very logical. And I, I really guarded my heart, you know, where everybody else was like, I'm in love. I'm in love. I'm like, you're not in love. You're too young to be in love. And I was like, you know, 15, you know. But I had that understanding that love was a gift. And, and love was something more than a feeling. So later on, um, when I finally met my husband, I met him, I was doing a retreat in Ann Arbor, Michigan at Christ the King, a very charismatic and beautiful parish. And I, I met him briefly. He was the music minister. And then I saw him again at a, at a big conference. We had a mutual friend. And I remember when I met him, I was like, there is something different about this guy. Like, he just had so much love in his heart. He had his purity, his love for God. It was like just something in me was like I just loved him so much, even though I did barely knew him. I'm going, okay, Caroline, you're going crazy. Stop it. You know, like, get, get a hold of yourself. I'm like, and every time I tried to, like, fight it, it just overwhelmed me. It was like this, and it wasn't Eros love. It was a gothic, a gothic love. It was just this deep love. I wanted to sacrifice for him. And... You know, it, it just over, you know, overwhelmed me. And then finally, my husband Dan told me, uh, on a, you know, we barely knew each other. He goes, it was, he goes, it was an epic. He goes, it could have been an epic failure. Because like, because he honestly didn't know me that well. He's like, I think I'm falling in love with you. I'm like, okay, all right. So we were on the same page. He he moved to New Jersey, and we finally got married. Yada yada yada. Okay. So Dan wasn't my first love. My first love happened when I was very young. So I told you I am a, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn at first. I, um, and my family was like, you know, they were Italian Catholics. You know, we had the sacred heart up, you know, maybe the Lord's Supper if you're really, you know, into that. And, you know, there was a, a devotion to, to God, but it was still like, you know, more of traditional, you know, just part of the tradition. So we went to church on Sundays, but my parents had taught me the faith. I mean, in the sense that we prayed, you know, I prayed every morning. I had a, I had a relationship with God. I didn't know much about church teaching or anything like that. And when I was young, I felt very close to God. My grandmother had a devotion to the Blessed Mother, um, taught me the rosary when I was young. I remember I was part of the uh, Blue Army. I joined the Blue Army when I was really young and made rosaries for prisoners and prayed for the souls in purgatory. And... And, um, and so I, you know, and, and when I was young, I really felt like I was called to do big things. But I, when I can tell you, I was ordinary. I was not exceptional at anything. I was average in school. I was average in sports. I was average in about everything that I did. But inside, I felt this like calling from God. You are called to do something great, Caroline. And let me tell you something, when you're in public school, especially in the New York public school system, and the only thing exceptional about you is your love for God, it's ugly, okay? This is not a good thing. There is nowhere in the yearbook, you know, at first it said, you know, in the yearbook it says most popular, most likely to succeed. If it's like most likely to become a nun, you are in trouble, all right? So that's where I was at, and... Um, and I remember, like, when I got into junior high, it was, it was rough. I mean, you know, it was not easy, all right? These, these people were mean. And I, I you know, and I, I was just tired of not fitting in. I was tired of, of, of just not being accepted. So I started to compromise my faith. And as I got into high school, you know, it's like I wanted both. You know, I wanted to be close to God because I did know who the Lord was. But I also wanted to, you know, to, to get, a, you know, become accepted. So this is what I would do, okay? So this is what my week would look like. So I, on um, Sunday, I would go to church. Wednesday, I would teach CCD. And I'm sorry, and Sunday, I would lecture at my church. And I would teach CCD. I would go to youth group on Wednesday night. 
Then Friday, I would party hard, okay? And then Saturday, I would go, go to confession. And I would just do that over and over, all right? I was like, I, I, was like, I just kind of lived a double life. See, I wanted to be so bad I would go to hell, but I didn't want to be so good that God might ask me to be a nun. So I figured if I drank a little bit, he wouldn't want a drunk nun, and maybe I would get into purgatory. That was my plan, all right? So that's what I did. And, and, but after a while, as you can imagine, I, that wasn't working, okay? I, felt, I just felt this deep absence in my heart. I knew there was something more. You know, I, I, was, I was very mature for my age. Like, I knew that I was missing something. I went to a, a, a Catholic college by name only, okay, at first. And at this college, I was in the honors program. I was dating someone. I was the life of the party. I had everything you would want at 18 years old, you know. Like, I had it all. And yet, again, I felt this deep emptiness. And I remember, you know, going to, like, philosophy class, and the professor at this Catholic school was teaching that God was not real. And I remember being so confused that this professor was teaching me this. And, and I was starting to doubt my faith. How do I know that Jesus Christ is real? How do I know that my faith, you know, that I've been taught since I was little is real? How do I know that Buddhism isn't real or Hinduism, you know? I went to this, you know, just this dark place of just, you know, confusion. And when I got back from college... I remember just going into my room and just having a heart-to-heart -heart with God, which I'm sure many of you have had, when you really lay it all out, you know. And I just, I just, you know, I started crying. I was like, God, I don't know if you're real, but if you're real and you love me, I will give my life to you. You can ask me to do anything. I'll be a nun. I'll be a missionary. You can even send me to Africa. I don't care anymore. I just want to, I just want to, just to know that you, you're real and you love me. And God was good because, you know, when we cry out to God, God can't help but answer that prayer. Because he loves us, right? So God started doing all these crazy things. And, 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 and I wound up going to a parish mission. And I went to the parish mission the first night. It was all right. I was a little bit of a punk, though. You know, I had my hair short on one side, long on the other. It was like three different colors. You know, I was literally a punk, right? And so the third night was going to be confession. And the people that invited me to this mission um, were like, yeah, yeah, tomorrow's confession. I'm like, all right, let me just tell you something, Pat. There's no way I'm going to confession. I go, first of all, if I tell the priest my sins, they're probably going to die. And it's going to be my fault. I said, so I don't want that on my soul. And she's like laughing at me. She's like, listen, just go and listen to the priest. You don't have to go to the sacrament. I'm like, oh, I could do that. You know, I'm like, you know, I could, I could. So I go to church that day, and I'm a punk. I sit all the way in the back like you guys in the back. And I, uh, just joking, and I had my hands crossed like that, you know. And, and I was like, what is this priest going to say to me? What is he, what could he possibly say to me? So he gets up, and he's really funny. And he's like, you know when you're little, you're so afraid to go to confession that you make up sins? You're like, bless me, Father, if I have sinned. I hit my brother. You don't even have a brother, but you just start making stuff up, you know. Like one of my friends is a priest, and a little guy came in and said, Father, I committed adultery. He's like, son, what do you mean? He goes, I acted like an adult. You know, like we're, when we're little, we're confused. We're like, I covered my neighbor's wife. I killed someone. You know, we're just nervous. And he goes, but you know what? When you're little, you're afraid. But when, you get, when you're older, you know that's God's mercy. That is the Lord himself that forgives you in that sacrament. And God, we don't have to be afraid. And I was like, oh, gosh. I'm going to, all right, all right. All right, Laura, I'll go, I'll go to confession, you know. Now, because I'm a punk and I'm in the back, the confessions are at the front of the church. By the time I get on this line, it's like an hour long, you know. And isn't that the worst? When you're waiting online to confession for an hour, you're sweating, you're trying to figure out what you're going to say, you know, all that. Well, there was this girl in front of me. And she was like the only young person at this thing. And, you know, light is beaming down on heaven. You know, from heaven. it was like, oh, you know, she's praying the rosary. She's very holy. And I'm like, all right, you know, if I could just talk to this girl just to pass the time. So I'm like, oh, God, please help this holy girl stop praying. I need to talk to her, you know. And then, and then finally she stops praying. I'm like, oh, my name is Caroline. And, and in, while we're walking, she's like, listen, I belong to this prayer group. Here's my number. Let me get your number. You really should go. This is going to be, it would be really great for you. So finally, it's my time to go to confession. 
And I just give one, one of the most heartfelt confessions I had ever done in my life up to that point. And I remember when I left the confessional, the thought that went through my head is, Satan, you're out of my life. That there were just sins I couldn't break free from. There was something about this moment in this sacrament that I knew my heart was ready to live for him. Now, God knew that Caroline, at the time Gambali, was not going to make it, okay? No matter what, I just didn't have, like, I had a whole life of sin waiting for me, right? I had my boyfriend, I had, I, I, my father got me to get, got me to get, uh, got me my fake ID so I could drink in college, right? So I was all set up to go back and party, you know? But my heart was there, so the Lord knew, knew I needed more. So that girl calls me up, and she's like, hey, you want to come to this prayer group? Now I'm on a roll. I figure, all right, now I've been to a mission. What's a prayer group? You know, we'll see what that's about, you know. So I called my friend. I didn't want to go alone, so I called my friend Lauren. I'm like, Lauren, could you come to this prayer group with me? You know, she was the only friend that wasn't partying in college like everybody else. So anyway, so my friend Lauren and I go to this prayer group. And I saw something I'd never seen before. Happy Catholics. These Catholics were happy, all right? They were praising the Lord. I was like, I don't know what this is, but they were happy. And they were so happy to see me. I was young. They were like all hugging me. You know, in New York, you don't hug. I mean, maybe if you know someone, you're Italian. But I was like, I don't know these people. And they're hugging me. I'm like, give me a little room. Anyway, so, so the prayer group goes. And they start witnessing to these miracles that God has done. They, they prayed over this, like, little child in Medjugorje. And she, that, that child was blind and was able to see. And I remember sitting there in my seat go, I want to know God like that. And at the end of the prayer group, they said, if anyone wants prayer, come to the back of the church. So I was like, you know, I need prayer. You know, so I started getting online to be prayed with. All right, so I'm so watching people, you know, I'm like, I'm like, you know, praying God. And I feel like God's saying, Caroline, this is your moment to give it all to me. So I'm like, okay. Then I see something that I had not seen before. I saw people go from the vertical position to the horizontal position. And I am not happy, okay? I go, oh my gosh, I joined a cult. I got to get out of here. I'm like, this is crazy. I don't see this. I don't see this at church, you know. I don't see this at CCD. No one told me about this. So, so I start to, like, see the exit. You know, if, if people that are from Brooklyn, it was Mount Renrisa where, the, where this uh, retreat center was. So I start making my way towards the exit. And that girl, Michelle, that I met online goes, are you okay? I go, no, 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 I'm not okay. You know, call 911, man down, man down. Like, why are we acting like this is all right? This is not all right. She's like, oh, Caroline, that's the Holy Spirit. I'm like, all right, well, I, I don't really want the Holy Spirit. She goes, no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit works in different ways and different people. You don't have to be afraid. Anyway, so my friend Lauren is German. She's a good German stock. She goes, listen, I'll go first. When the little Italian ladies start try to push me down, I'll fight them off, and I won't fall. So then when it's your turn, you could go, and then, you know, they'll try to push you down, and, and you know, you, you'll, be, you'll be okay, you know, because I went first. I'm like, okay, that's great, great. You go first. You show me, you know. So Lauren goes, the little Italian ladies surround her. I'm like watching Lauren, and all of a sudden, what do you think happens to Lauren? She falls down. She rests in the spear. I'm like, oh, no. I want to, like, kick Lauren. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm stepping over. It's my turn. And now the little Italian ladies surround me. So I, I tell the little, because I'm, you know, again, I'm, I'm from Brooklyn, you know, originally. I'm like, listen, if I fall, it's not because of the Holy Spirit. It's because I fainted. And they're like, ha, 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 praise you, Jesus. And they all just started laying hands on me and praying with me. All right, so. Now, I really, truly wanted the Holy Spirit, but I didn't want to fall. So I was like, I get into this position, all right? I was like, if I squat, these little Italians can't do it. So I'm like, so I have my, my hands open. I'm like, oh, God, come into my life. I love you. Don't let me fall. Lord, I love you. I love you. Don't let me fall. And I'm like, and I'm trying to be open and yet, like, trying to, like, you know, brace my body just in case the little Italians try to push me. And then as, as I'm praying, I just feel this incredible power of the Lord. Just fill me all of my being with this presence of love. And it overwhelms me. And I rest in the spirit. And it's like, I got to tell you, I didn't know what was going on, you know, at the moment. But I remember thinking, you are real, God. And when I came up from that, I, I finally got up. Someone goes, this is your new birthday. I had no idea. I'm like, happy birthday to me. What are these people talking about? You know? 
but I was so filled with joy. Like, I got to tell you, I was so filled with love for God, for God's people. I remember being, I had an internship in Manhattan, and I was on the Staten Island Ferry. And literally, I wanted to go to people and say, I love you. I was like a crazy woman, all right? I was in love, all right? I was in love. I just wanted to, to love God with all of my being. I wanted everyone to know about Jesus, okay? And so I, I always say that the Holy Spirit helped me to fall in love with Jesus Christ. But it was the Eucharist that sustained it. I wound up transferring to Franciscan University. And that is where my love for the Eucharist grew. Everyone went to daily mass. All right, this place was like, every, mass is filled. I started going to daily mass. And then I, I started to learn how to adore the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Now, I came into the school, like, I just found the Lord. I, I was very raw. And these people, like, when I first came in, they were like, all the Steubenville people were like, oh, this girl needs help, you know. So I, this one girl, every day she would come to me and say, so what did God say to you today? I'm like, uh, what? 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 Carolyn, what did God say to you today? I was like, uh, hi? I don't know. <laughs> what did he say to you? I don't know what's going on. So like for like every day she would ask me this question. And finally I'm like, what are you talking about? God talks to you? What do you I, don't, I don't understand what you mean. She goes, follow me. And she brings me into my dorm to a little chapel. She goes, every day you need to spend time here. And she showed me, like, she had her Bible. She goes, you know, get a Bible, you read the scriptures, you, you journal. And she taught me how to have a holy hour. So I was like, okay. So the next day I go in, I'm like, I sat in front of the Lord. I'm like, Lord, you got to help me here. you got to talk to me because this girl's going to find me. And I have to tell her something that you told me because she is driving me crazy, you know. And that's how I learned to listen. And it was in the Blessed Sacrament. The Lord taught me how to forgive. It was in, with the blessed sacrament, the Lord guided my life. That he spoke to my heart. That he, he, that he um, helped me through deep, deep trials. You know, that is what sustained my love. What is your love story? What is your love story? Do you remember when you felt that first calling to be ordained? When you felt that sense that God was setting you apart for something amazing and beautiful? That you knew your life was going to be different. Your journey was going to be different. Do you remember that love that you had that you would sacrifice all? Do you remember the moment that day you were ordained? And the excitement you had. And the nervousness you had. When the, when the bishop anointed you with oil. Priests, do you remember when the, when, the, when the bishop anointed your hands with a lot of oil? <laughs> and priests from all over your diocese came and laid hands on you. Do you remember the first time that you, that you heard a confession, that you baptized a baby, that you anointed the sick? God wants us to recapture that first love. You know, I remember when I, would, you know, when I first gave my life to God, I would get, I mean, I wanted to give everything. I've lost a little of that spunk. I know you see a lot of spunk. But I can still have more spunk for the Lord, all right? But God wants us to give all. Our first love needs to be the Eucharist. It says, there's no priesthood without the Eucharist and no Eucharist without the priesthood. I've, been, I've read many incredible books that have shaped my spirituality, many, many saints. But there's one book in particular that had a very profound effect on me. And it was um, He Leadeth Me by Father Walter Chesek. Has anyone ever read that book? This is an amazing book, okay. It, it's about this, the, what his story is that he was a, a young, in the, during the time of World War II, he was a young um, a Jesuit priest. And when he was in the seminary, one day his superior came Look, I have flashing lights. Woohoo! All right, so um, his superior came in one day and wrote and read a letter from Pope Pius XI asking the priest, specifically the Jesuit priests, if any of them would go into Russia and to help the people of God there because a lot of the uh, bishops and priests were, were um, being, you know, imprisoned and sent to labor camps. 
So this is distracting. So if anyone could get rid of these lights, that would be really helpful. Okay, so <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, so basically what happened was he, when he became a priest, he was sent, you know, he finally was able to get into Russia. He was in Poland. Something happened in Poland. I think Germany was taking over. And he was able to sneak into Russia at that time where there's a lot of confusion. And when he got there, he spent a little bit of time, but he was quickly um, arrested. They, they found out who he was, and he was, he was in prison for 23 years. Five years in solitary confinement. And then in those, five, in those times of solitary confinement, when he really was at his weakest point, when he was really being tortured and, and, and he was really not in a good place, he signed a confession saying he was a Vatican spy. So they sent him... Um, uh, f to 15 years of hard labor at a Siberian um, labor camp. So this man really suffered. But what's really interesting, he says, the hardest time of that whole time that I was there was in solitary confinement because I couldn't celebrate the Eucharist. He said, I hungered for the Eucharist and I hungered for food. They would give him such little food to eat. I long to hold Jesus in my hands. I long to receive him. He goes, this was my greatest cross. So when he was sent to the, li the, the, the labor camp, what was interesting is he found out quickly he could say mass because they had this elaborate system of, of people outside the labor camp and inside the labor camp to bring in um, wine and, and they would be able to save the little bit of bread they had for food to, to consecrate it. So he was excited about that. But this is what he said. I want to I uh, quote him because it's so beautiful. He goes, sometimes I think that those who have never been deprived of an opportunity to say or hear Mass do not really appreciate the treasure the Mass is. I know in any event when it came to mean, mean to me and the other priests I met in the Soviet Union. I know the sacrifices we made the risks we ran in order to just have a chance to say or hear Mass. When we were constantly hungry in the camps, when the food we got each day was just barely enough to keep us going, I have seen priests pass up breakfast and work at hard labor on an empty stomach until noon in order to keep the Eucharistic fast because the noon break was when we could get together and have a hidden Mass. The intensity of devotion of both priests and prisoners made up for everything. There were no altars, candles, bells, flowers, music. Yet in these primitive conditions, the mass brought you closer to God than anyone might conceivably imagine. The realization of what was happening penetrated deep into the soul. We would be severely punished if we were discovered saying mass. There were always informers, but the mass to us was always worth the danger and the sacrifice. We treasured it. We looked forward to it. We would do almost anything in order to say or attend a mass. And I would go to any length, suffer any inconvenience, run any risk to make the bread of life available to these men. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall have life and have it more abundantly. These men were simple. And, and had a direct faith, Gra you know, grasp this truth. They believed it. They could not explain it as a theologian might, but they accepted it and lived by it and were willing to make voluntary sacrifices, even in a life of almost total deprivation, in order to receive the bread of life. Mass and the Blessed Sacrament were a source of great consolation to me, they were the source of my strength and my joy and spiritual substance. But it was when I realized what the Holy Eucharist meant to these men, what sacrifice they were able to make for it, that I felt animated, privileged, and driven to make it possible for them to receive the bread of life as often as they wished. No danger, no risk, no retaliation could prevent me from saying Mass every day for them. As often as you do this, do it in memory of me. Life in the labor camps was Calvary for these men in, in, ways, in many ways. 
There was nothing I would not do to offer the sacrifice of Calvary again for them each day in the Mass. One of the most incredible gifts Father Cheswick was able to receive is really to be without the Eucharist. Because in that time, he came to appreciate this gift that many of us take for granted. Amen? He longed for it. He yearned for it. He knew he needed it. He is, a, he is a priest that understood that the Eucharist was not only the source and summit of his faith, it was the source and summit of his life, of his existence. Do we desperately need Jesus like that? Do we go to the Eucharist with that desperate need for him, with that longing for him? That's Father Walter. Pope Benedict XVI said, It is impossible to receive the Lord every day, taking his body and blood into our hands, pronouncing the tremendous and wonderful words, This is my body, this is my blood, without letting ourselves be seized by him, without letting ourselves be won by fascination for him, without letting his infinite love change us from within. Do we have that fever? Or do we need to like renew that fever? Do we need to renew our love? So how do we do this? You know, um, the first thing is spend time with him. You know, every vocation is about fulfilling God's call to love, right? And, you know, even in married life, if you're not spending time with the beloved, you get cranky, all right? And it's, I'm sure it's the same with you. When you're not spending time with the Lord, you're going to be cranky, all right? You're going to say, why did I get myself into this? Sometimes in marriage, I go, what, what, did I, what was I thinking? You know, I have those little ones. They're all asking me for things. <laughs> Holy cow, you know? But you forget. When you, when you don't spend time with the beloved, you forget. And, and so it's important to take that time. So anyway, we have, you know, when we had the fourth child, it got a little crazy in our house, all right? Um, and, and. You know, we, sometimes we just feel like we're just getting by each day. We're just trying to manage these little ones. We're just, you know, and we're, we're cranky towards each other. You know, we're frustrated, you know. And, and you, get, you get to a bit, you know, a crazy point. So anyway, there's, a, there's a, a comedian, Jim Gaffigan. When he had his fourth child, he said, you know, a lot of people are asking me, what is it like to have four children? He goes, picture yourself drowning and someone handing you a baby, <laughs> Okay. And that's how it feels, you know? And you're like, you're just trying to manage it. You're just dying, you know? So a couple of, a, a month and a half ago, Dan's uh, company had a trip, okay, to a resort. And they were, you, they were allowed to invite their wives. So we went. And we went with the baby, too, because she was just, you know, born. And, you know, we spent time together. We enjoyed each other's company. We laughed. We were just able to just renew our covenant of marriage, you know, just by just just by just hanging out, having fun together, you know, without the responsibilities of these little ones, you know. And I remember after that trip, I'm like, oh, I like him. I, <laughs> that's why I married him. I forgot. He's driving me so crazy. But when I was able to take that time with the beloved, I, I appreciated him again. And we need to do that with the Eucharist, right? We need to go to that first love. We need to get sustained by the Lord. To hear his heart's cry. For you to share your heart's cry. To rest in him. To hear his voice about how he's calling us to pastor. We need that intimacy with the beloved. You know, intimacy is into me see. Into me see. In adoration, we, we see the beloved. The beloved allows us to see into his heart. And the Lord invites us to let him see into ours. And it's this beautiful love exchange. And don't underestimate the power of, of your time with the Lord, of your intimacy with the Lord. Because when a priest or a deacon loves the Eucharist and is spending time in adoration we could tell, okay, 
we could tell the fruit of your contemplation comes out in your preaching. When a priest loves the Lord, it flows. When he talks about Jesus, and he doesn't just talk about it from a historical sense. He's talking about Jesus that he knows, that he, he loves, that he's heard from. When a priest is in love with the Eucharist, when he says mass, you can tell he because he's taking time when he prays that those words of consecration. You could tell it's his love song. It's coming from his heart. He's trying to say every word deliberately with his heart. So no, it makes a difference. The Lord wants to be seen. Into me see. And this was his, what happened on the road to Emmaus. And I love this story. You know, you know, some of his disciples, you know, were, you know, walking along the path. And they were, you know, they were upset. You know, Jesus had died. There was confusion. You know, like he was popping up in different places, you know. And, and, and you know what's cool? Like God gives Jesus one of the coolest superhero disguises of all, okay? So, like, you know, Jesus is Jesus. You know, he does miracles. And, stuff, and now no one can recognize him, you know. So he's having fun with it, right? He's popping around and stuff. So he, he so the disciples are walking along the way, and he's like, you know, I'm just going to show up to this thing. And, and he's very, like, chill about it. You know, he just kind of walks with them. He's like, so, like, what are you guys talking about, you know? And these guys are like, oh, you know, what's wrong with you? You not, you know, like, did, did you hear about Jesus dying in Jerusalem? And they're telling him about the whole story. And then, and then they're like, yeah. And then, you know, the women went to the tomb, and, and his body wasn't there. And then these angels came, and they said, he's alive. And then we all ran to the tomb, but, you know, we couldn't see him. And they, they were walking. It's so funny because, you know, they can't see him, but they're walking with Jesus, right? And they're walking for a long time, and they still couldn't see him. Then it says in Scripture that Jesus, you know, is like, all right, these guys are dojos. i got to explain the Scripture, why this, you know, the Son of God had to die for them. So he starts explaining all the Scriptures. And it says that they had fire burning in their hearts when he was talking to them about the Word of God. And they still didn't see him. Now, if I was Jesus, I would have been like, you clowns, you know. Ta-da, you know, here I am, I'm Jesus. <laughs> but Jesus does something very profound. It says, and it happened that while he was with them at table, he took the bread, said the blessing and broke it and gave it to them. It says, and when he gave it to them, with that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. It's so amazing. When Jesus gives the Eucharist to them, and they take it from him, it's like their eyes were opened. And, and in this incredible moment where they're like, Whoa. It's like then he, he disappears. Like, wait, where do you go? Where do you go? You know? And it was like Jesus was saying to them, don't look for me in my resurrected state. I am here. I am here. I am the bread of life. I have become your sustenance. And this is enough. Look to me here. How beautiful. In the summit, uh, I'm sorry, for the Eucharist, all right, that's the road to Emmaus. I haven't been doing good at clicking. All right, there you go. We're going to get the whole story <laughs> It says, the unseen God manifested himself in the word made flesh, his son, Jesus Christ. After the ascension, what until then was visible of our Redeemer was changed into a sacramental presence. For this reason, we see one thing and understand another. We see a man, Jesus, but we make an act of faith in God. And I love what Mother Teresa says, very beautiful. When you look at the crucifix, you understand how much Jesus loved you then. When you look at the sacred host, you understand how much Jesus loves you now. And just like the disciples, we can spend a whole lot of time with Jesus, right? But do we see him? Do we truly see him? And if you ask me, how much time should I spend in adoration? You know, I'm busy. I'm bu 
we are all busy. Oh my gosh, I'm so busy, I can't even tell you. Okay, so I'm not judging anyone, all right? I would say this. Spend as much time in adoration until you feel satisfied that you have seen him and he has seen you. You know, one of the most beautiful stories um, about adoration that I've, you know, I've ever heard is about um, this, the, that little girl in China. You know, during the Boxer uh, re Rebellion in 1900 when the communists took over China, you know, they were trying to get rid of anything that resembled Christianity because it represented the Western world. And one day in this little town in China, there was, just, there was these children in, in, in a Catholic schoolroom. And this uh, inspector came in. And he started, when he saw this, all the images of God around, he started like ripping them off the walls, like the crucifixes and the holy pictures. And, and he was screaming at these children. And he, and he ordered the kids to put all these things in a box and bring it to the toilet bowl. At first, the kids resisted. But then, uh, you know, because he had a, he had a, a sh you know, uh, a gun, they, they started to do what he said. But there was this little girl in the back of the classroom. And she just had her head down like this. And when this inspector saw her, he started screaming at her, do as I say. And she just didn't move. She just, just kept her head down and just a tear came down from her eye. And she just stood there. So the inspector said, get this girl's father. So they, they take the girl's father. And then at this point, they move all the children into the church. And now at this point, they have a whole crowd gathered. And this inspector um, gets the Eucharist, takes out the Eucharist, and he orders the soldiers to, to desecrate the Eucharist, to stomp on the Eucharist, to show them that this is not God. And he said to them, do you still believe in the fairy tales your priest has told you? And the little girl just sat there. At this point, another um, soldier came in that was more familiar with the town and made a deal with, with, this, with this inspector to, to disperse the, the crowd. They took the father away. Um, the people left, and it, just the little girl remained at the communion rail. The priest was locked into a coal bin where he was able to see a little bit through this uh, little opening. And this little girl finally left. But that night, this priest heard a noise in the church. And he looks in his little you know, view, and he sees that little girl come in. Very quietly come in. She kneels down before one of the hosts. She prays. She puts her head down, and with her tongue, she takes a consecrated host. She kneels, she kneels back up and folds her hands and says a, a prayer. And then she quietly leaves. And each night, this little girl came to adore the Lord, to protect the Lord, to receive the Lord. Until one day, she woke up a soldier, and to the horror of the priest, she was shot. The soldier runs forward, sees the little girl, is, is visibly shaken, and runs out of the church. Then he comes back in. He lets the priest out. The priest comes to the little girl, and, and she has she is definitely passed away. But this, this communist soldier said to the priest, if there was a little girl like this in every town, I don't believe any soldier could fight for communism. Now, this, her martyrdom was not in vain. This story went from priest to priest, from town to town. In fact, when, when Fulton Sheen heard this story, it was this story that inspired him to make a holy hour for the rest of his life. He made a promise to God to spend an hour in adoration and to spread that devotion, to, you know, to everyone he meets. The second thing is make your heart a tabernacle for him. You know, it's so interesting on how many of God's mysteries are revealed in creation, right? So, like, we see it in the Holy Trinity, in the family, you know. And so, we, when we had our fourth baby, 
you know, it was a pretty, pretty cool thing because we had lost a few babies before that. So when I was pregnant, I was like, I just got to really take this in, you know, like, because the first three were so fast that I couldn't even think about it. But like the, third, the fourth one, I'm like, I'm going to really remember this, you know. And there was just something so beautiful about caring life. You know, like even when the baby is within you, you feel little kicks and stuff and and you're like, wow, you know, this is, you know, you really realize this is life. You know, you, you could press on your stomach and the baby responds, responds to voices. But you can't see this baby. You know, it was like there's still a veil between me and the baby. You know, I didn't know what she looked like. I didn't know she had a little pout when she would cry. I didn't know what her color eyes she had or, or, you know, what her smile looked like. You know, but when I finally had her, you know, I see this, you know, this, this beautiful baby. And, I, and I, I'm like, wow. And I finally saw her face and I said, she doesn't look like me. <laughs> what, God, what are you thinking? You know? but, but, I, 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 but she was mine. And I was like, you know, we were so, you know, overwhelmed with joy. But I could tell you, even when I didn't feel her movement, I loved what I could not see. I loved what I could not see. And Mary, the mother of God, bore Jesus. She was the bearer of God. And we are called to bear Jesus, right, by being a living tabernacle for him. And just like a mother carries, you know, a baby and, and feels signs of, of their presence, even though we cannot see, it's the same thing with the Eucharist, right? We hear about Eucharistic miracles and it inflames our faith. We hear God when we pray. We hear his, the Lord speaking to our hearts. We feel his love when we receive him. We love what we, we cannot see. And the Lord just wants us to prepare a tabernacle for him, a place where he can rest, a place where he could be. He's not loved in the world. He needs a place to rest. He needs a place to be. And so that is what the Lord is calling us to. You know, I, when I, when, when, with Father Cheswick in that story, he leadeth me, what really just really touched me is that um, even though the priest would have to sometimes fast from dinner all the way through noon, a lot of the prisoners had to fast even to the next dinner because they weren't able to go to mass at noon because they didn't want to have a lot of people around the priests or else they would get arrested. You know, people would know. So those prisoners doing this hard labor would fast, okay, for like a whole day doing the most intense work, you know, that they had. Because of their great love. And I'm, I was thinking about these, these guys were dirty. They were uneducated. They, were, they were, had nothing to offer, you know. Um, and yet they made the most beautiful tabernacle of their hearts for the Lord. And, and they put me to shame. They put me to shame. How many times have I gone to the Eucharist not prepared my heart? How many times have I been late for church? How many times have I been distracted during the consecration? And yet these men put me to shame. I'll tell you an embarrassing story. The other day I was at Mass and my seven-year-old daughter goes, Mom, what's this part of the Mass? This is amazing. What is it called? I'm like, honey, it's the beginning of Mass, you know. But we are always so late for church that she thought this was so cool, like that, that these priests were, you know, coming down the aisle. I was like, my husband's like, oh, my gosh. You know, it was like this epic fail, you know, the hall of shame of all Catholic parents. I'm like, she's like, I was like, it's the opening hymn, honey. It's the opening hymn. I'm like, oh, my gosh. It was like Jesus is speaking to me through the child, you know, like, Caroline, you need to come to Mass on time, you know. But it was embarrassing. Thing, you know, but this thing about making your heart a living tabernacle, you know, um, you know, the Lord gave me a profound vision of this. But before I go into this, how many of you know a control freak? Raise your hand. How many of you are a control freak? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, I'm Italian, okay. Now, how many people have an Italian wife or an Italian mother, all right? Uh, not many. Okay, well, these, let me tell you something. They're very controlling. All right, if you've seen Everyone Loves Raymond, the, you know, the mother in law. It's ugly, okay? They like to control everything. I have it in me too. I can't help it. All right. So, but um, you know, you any 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 culture that puts saran uh, that puts um, plastic on the couches has got issues, okay? Because when you are trying to protect the couch from being sat upon, it's ugly. All right, you got control issues. All right. So, 
and this is something about being clean. But anyway, when I, so when I was growing up, when we would have relatives come over to the house, I mean, our cleaning situation went to DEFCON 1, all right? It was like, there was, you know, you know he's not even Italian. He understands, right? It was crazy. And we was like, you know, there was screaming, yelling going on. Vacuums were coming out. There was like, you know, it was just bad. You know, we were all like, you know, we had to put everything away. I remember trying to shove things in my closet. And my mother found me. She's like, your titsy rose is going to look in that closet. So you get those toys out of there, you know? It's like, it was like this, this I hated company, you know, because we had to just clean everything. But there was nothing like when the first grandchild came. All right, that was taken to a whole new level. Germs were the enemy. My mother had Clorox on one hand and Lysol on the other. She was going through that house. There were things sprayed and clean that we had never seen before, all right? They, we were ready for this baby, all right? This is gonna, like the baby. Well, the baby's coming, the baby's coming, all right? So I, um, I came home the night before the baby was going to come into the house. And, and, you know, I, I'm not one to have visions or dreams, but when I've had them throughout my life, they have made a big impact on me. And this night was going to be one of those nights. So I have this dream, and the Lord is showing me. He's, like, taking me through my house. He's, like, look how this is clean. I go, maybe, I was, like, is God Italian? What is this? Why are you so concerned about the clean? I mean, he really was. He's, like, they say, how this is clean and this is clean. I'm, like, okay, Lord, yep, I see that, you know. And the Lord says something to me. He said, how I wish my children would prepare their hearts for Holy Communion as you have prepared for this child. And he showed me this innocence and beauty of this baby. And he's like, and he showed me his heart and how beautiful and innocent and holy. And it was just the sadness in the Lord that we do not prepare our hearts for him. And I was, I, I remember waking up out of the dream and just crying. I was like, Lord, and I felt like it was like, I, was, I felt this message was not just for me personally, it was for like the world. And I felt this incredible, just deep understanding of how important it was to make your heart a holy place for him. He deserves our best. He deserves our best. So the next thing is, you know, when we spend time with the beloved, when we make our heart a tabernacle, the next thing is we want to share the Eucharist, right? When we are in love with someone, we want everyone to know about the beloved. That's what love does. We want to give that love. And the most beautiful thing we could do as priests and deacons and, and you know, some priests to be is to, 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 one, teach about the Eucharist to our people. Where there is indifference, when there is doubt, we need to teach about the reality that this is Jesus Christ and that God loves them and wants to make his home in their hearts. That's the gift we need to give to our people. But the second thing is to offer adoration. Is to offer adoration. You know, Dan and I, we do parish missions around the country, okay, my husband and I. And we, adoration is a big part of our mission. We have adoration almost every night of our mission. But the first night we do something really special. We, 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 we talk about the hemorrhaging woman. And then we either use the altar cloth or we put like a, like a cloth all the way down, you know, to the, to the edge of the um, altar. And we, we invite people. We say, Jesus Christ is here in the Blessed Sacrament. Come up. We're going to invite you to come up around the altar and, and touch the hem of Jesus. And just, just pray from your heart, whatever it is that you need. And we watch, and a lot of the people that we attract, because we have, you know, our, our ministry really attracts, like, young families, really attracts a lot of people that aren't going to church. So sometimes this is the first time they've ever been in adoration. And they come, they come up, and, and you can see, like, this, this, this incredible, like, change in, 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 their, in, their, who they, in their, you know, in their expression. You see that they believe, you see they're being touched. You know, and, and it's funny because one day uh, you know, I was doing a, 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 retreat, uh, a mission for Father Midori in Brooklyn. And a guy came over to me and goes, that was amazing. I was able to get so close to Jesus. And I just wanted to chuckle because I was like, you just received him a couple of hours ago. I mean, you received the bread of life. But there's something about adoration. There's something about seeing Jesus. 
you know, like the Lord wants to be seen. There's something and that, that people's eyes are open to the reality of this divine love. 